Praise the Lord. I'm excited about what God is doing in your life. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to declare that over your life this morning. I want you to repeat after me, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in me, he will complete it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. Give God a clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Would you give the person next to you a great big smile, a great big hug, a handshake, a welcome. Let them know that you are glad to be here this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 We all look so much better on Sunday morning, don't we? I mean spiritually. <laughs> Just in between the week, we have to get it together. Amen. But God, give us grace. I want to just conclude a message that I began uh, two weeks ago, a vision of God, a vision of God, part three. If you would open up in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah chapter six, the story begins with the death of a king. He was a great king. He had led the nation into much prosperity and much expansion and much success. But when he died, things began to change. The Israelites, the people of God began to fall away. They began to stray from the Lord. They walked away from God. They walked away from the covenant, um, their relationship with God. In the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, we see... Isaiah challenging the people of God. He's reproving them. He's rebuking them. He's trying to call them back to God. And you see in chapter 5, he is declaring woe. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who love intoxicating drink. And woe to those who justify the wicked. And he goes on and on. The tone changes from the sin and the evil and the darkness of all that's going on around him. And in chapter 6, Isaiah experiences something so powerful. Isaiah experiences the glory and the holiness of God. He gets an awesome revelation of the character and the greatness of God. For Isaiah, this is a, an awakening in his life. He walks into the house of God one day, the temple back then, and he walks into church, if you will, to worship God, just like you and I this morning. And he starts out in the natural, but then he enters into the spirit realm. He starts out in the natural, but then he begins to experience the supernatural. He starts out maybe just in the mundane but then he experiences the miraculous. I want you to understand something this morning. You came into this place. Maybe some of you came in discouraged. Maybe some of you came in tired. Maybe some of you didn't have enough coffee. Maybe your wife burnt the toast. Whatever the issue was, you come in here. But something can change. Something will change in the presence of God. And for Isaiah, he is no longer taken up with an earthly king, he's no longer taken up with the sin of the people and, and the negativity around him. Now he is taken up with the glory in the presence of Almighty God. He steps into a new place, a new place with God. And that's my desire for you. That's my desire for my own life is that I would always enter into a new place of revelation a new place of encountering God, experiencing God's presence. And when Isaiah does that, he's changed. One glimpse of God, one encounter with God changes everything. In this moment, Isaiah connects with God on a higher level, on another level. And isn't that supposed to be the experience of the child of God? Scriptures tell us we are supposed to go from faith 
to faith. Go from glory to glory, from strength to strength. Now, in the meantime, in the into intermediate period, from strength to strength, you might go through a little weakness. Uh, glory to glory, you might go through a little valley. And, and faith to faith, you might go through some setbacks and discouragements. But ultimately, God wants us to go from one place to another and to be strengthened in the, our inner man. Have you ever been in church? Well, you are in church this morning. But have you ever been in church? And I'm speaking, but all of a sudden, it's no longer me speaking, but God begins to speak to you. All of a sudden, God takes my feeble words, my feeble attempt to communicate the, the plan and the purpose of God, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit enlarges and enlightens it and, and speaks to your heart, and you no longer hear me, you begin to hear God speaking to you, and you begin to get a revelation. God begins to speak uh, specifically to your life, to what's going on in your life at that point, and, and sometimes you might even think that somebody told me something about you. But it wasn't anybody giving me any inside information. It was the Holy Spirit just tugging upon your heart and uh, speaking to where you're at and, and trying to communicate. Because God loves you. He is a loving heavenly father. He is a loving shepherd. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And, and God could take my message. And, and you're all so different here this morning. You know, I have had the privilege of traveling to many different countries around the world and preaching the gospel and being in different places, different cultures, different socioeconomic uh, status, statuses and all over the world. And you know what? So different, so different. But really, we're so much alike on the inside. We have the same need. We have the same spiritual makeup, if you will. And the principles of the Word of God, the truths of the Word of God, they work in every generation, in every culture, in every place. Why? Because God's Word is true, and we're all made of the same stuff on the inside. We all have a human nature. We all have a spirit made by God and come from God, and we all are able to hear God if we have ears to hear. Turn to the person next to you and say, I hope you have ears to hear this morning. When God speaks to your heart, you get to know God better. You get to know God in a deeper way, in a wider way. Something happens down deep in your spirit. In Isaiah chapter 6, we see Isaiah going into the temple, and he's downcast, and he's troubled, and he's at a crisis point. But all of a sudden, he begins to get a revelation. He begins to have his eyes open, and he begins to see the holiness of God. And, and he hears the angels crying out one to another, holy, holy, holy. And you know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, this is the only place where we have a three-fold repetition of any word. And the word holy, holy, holy is used not just for repetition's sake, but for emphasis. You see, this is a building and a, and a bursting forth of the greatness and the holiness of God. You see, holiness means distinct, set apart, separate, meaning there's no one like God. He is holy and he is perfect in all his attributes and all his characteristics. There is no one like God. Isaiah sees the holiness of God and his response in verse 5 is, woe is me. He realizes how awesome God is, how holy God is, and, and how far short he falls. For the first time, he really sees himself as he is. Why? Because he sees God. In verse 6 and 7, the Bible tells us that an angel comes from the, the altar of God and takes a coal of fire and comes and, and, and puts it on his lips and it signifies the cleansing of Isaiah. The forgiveness of Isaiah. How many of you are grateful today for a beautiful word called, word called forgiveness? Forgiveness. To be forgiven is so awesome. It's so special. It's such a clean, pure word. And you and I have experienced forgiveness 
in Christ. It means our sins are forgiven, they're forgotten, and they're done away with. But many of us stop there in our experience. We stop there. Praise God, I'm forgiven. We got what I, we need. We're up good. We're on our way. But we're not just forgiven people. We are sent people. We're not just forgiven, but we are now sent on a mission. When you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it doesn't end with forgiveness, but we are sent now on a mission to share the same message with other people. Jesus said it to his disciples at the end, after the resurrection, before he ascended back to the Father. He said to his disciples, as the Father sent me, so send I you. We see this in verse 8 of this passage of scripture where we hear the voice of the Lord say, whom shall I send? This is not a picture of a desperate God pleading, feeling sorry, feeling hopeless, No, this is a picture of a gracious God calling out to an unworthy servant. God's question was Isaiah's opportunity. You see, this morning when we come into the house of God and we raise our hands in worship, we should also be lifting up our hands, not only upraised in worship, but also as an offering. Offering our life, giving our life to God. We say, God, use me where you will. And even when it comes time to giving in the offering plates, you know what, we can give a tithe, we can give an offering, but you know what, maybe there will be a time, maybe we'll get a bigger offering plate where we can stand and put ourselves in the offering. Not just giving a token, not just giving a tithe, but giving ourselves and saying, God, I am an offering to you. You see, in this passage of Scripture, the last two weeks, I've taken the time to uh, communicate what Isaiah saw and what he experienced. See, it wasn't, it's not just about experiencing God, but it's about what that experience does to you. The experience of God's presence or experiencing God's presence always changes you. You cannot be in the presence of God and stay the same. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. But if you're in Christ, you're a new person. So what was Isaiah's experience in his response? I want to go a little deeper and I want to I look at this. As he sees the angels crying out one to another, holy, holy, holy. And the Bible says that the the threshold was shaken and the temple of God was filled with the glory of God. With the glory, the Shekinah glory of the presence of God. And in the light of God's glory, Isaiah is catching a glimpse of the holiness of God. With hands raised, his eyes looking up in faith, his heart humbled, he has a spiritual breakthrough. In his revelation of God, something radically changes in his life. You and I need to go from faith to faith. We need to go from being changed from one place to another. Until we get to be with Jesus, until we get to heaven, we will need to change. Turn to the person next to you and say, you need to change. Oh, come on, you didn't sound so convincing. I want to quickly look at four points this morning. Number one, Isaiah's confession. Isaiah's confession. Let me read the passage of Scripture once again. If you have your Bibles, I love the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful. I don't only want you to hear it, I want you to see it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, in the train of his robe in the temple. Above it stood seraphim. These are angels. These are angelic hosts around the throne of God. The word seraphim means the burning ones. Each one of them had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Covering his face speaks of, of, of modesty. Covering his feet speaks of humility. Flying speaks of instant obedience. 
Here we have pure and holy angelic host in the presence of God. But even they understand the reverence and the holiness and, 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 and the purity of God. And the Bible says they cry to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Then I said... Then I said, you see, Isaiah has this experience, this encounter with God, and then he says, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Here we have Isaiah's confession. He said, woe is me. Now, up until this point, chapter 5, he's pronouncing woe on everybody else. But he comes to a point of seeing God. He catches a glimpse of God. And up until that point, he thought he was okay. Hello? But when he saw the holiness of God, when he came close to the presence of God, it revealed things in his life that weren't right. And no one told him, but he had an encounter with the living God. You see, it is impossible to walk with God, the one who is described as holy, 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 and not sense your unworthiness. I knew that would get you shouting, but hang on, stay with me. You see, when Isaiah sees God, he sees himself in a different light. In your spiritual journey, in where you're at, Right now, there are basically three perspectives. When you assess or when you look at yourself, there are three perspectives. There's your perspective, how you look at yourself and how you judge yourself. And what I have found is usually we're a lot easier on ourselves than we are on other people. Let me try this, this church over here. We generally are very easy and, and we're quick to be a little more harsh with other people. We, we judge ourselves in a very, uh, very uh, sweet light. light. <laughs> but, but there's the, our perspective, and then there's other people's perspective of how they view us and how maybe they judge us. Now, neither one of them are probably 100% or the best assessment. Then there's God's perspective, how God sees us. That's why the psalmist said, Lord, you search me. You try my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. Why? Because the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who could know it? I don't even know my own heart sometimes. And you don't know your own heart sometimes. That's why we need God to shine his light in our life. And see, when Isaiah got in the presence of God, he said, woe is me. He's no longer saying woe to anybody else. He's saying, it's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer right now. Woe is me. Now, see, some people, they don't want to come too close to God or too close to the church or too close to the Bible because it starts to reveal things. See, when the light's turned on, the cockroaches scatter. But when the room is dark, the cockroaches have their, the, the, the spiritual cockroaches have their place. Now, now let, me, let me switch the metaphor a little bit. Have you ever gone into a room where the lighting was so favorable, you looked in the mirror and you said, wow, I'm pretty good looking. But then you went into another room and the fluorescent lights were on and you said, oh Lord, have mercy. Why do you think in clubs, nightclubs, the lights are down low? So everybody looks good. But see, see, we, we stay away from the light because, you know, the Bible says, Jesus said in John chapter 3, men love darkness rather than light. And they don't come to the light lest their deeds be exposed, so they hide. 
But Isaiah now is in the burning, brining, uh, burning bright, shining light of the glory of God. And he said, woe is me. See, that's why we need revelations of God in the church. So there's no pride. There's no arrogance. There's no people puffed up and pointing their finger. We're all humble. We're all saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And Isaiah says, woe is me. Isaiah's changed. It's not just coming to church and say, oh, I felt good today. Oh, I was blessed. Oh, that for, oh I was, it was good service today. No, it's a little more. It's I've seen Jesus and I'll never be the same again. Amen. Isaiah says, woe is me. Woe is me. And, and he's a prophet of God. Imagine he's a prophet of God. See, it was, it was J. Oswald Sanders. Uh, Oswald Sanders. Sanders or Smith, he wrote, um, my utmost for his highest. He says, you could judge your growth in, in grace by your sensitivity to sin. In other words, you, you can judge how, how much you're growing in God by how sensitive you are to sin. Do you remember when you were first born again and, and you were so, so conscious of, of, of any little sin? And what happens? You grow and you get a little callous. The Bible says our consciences can become calloused as if seared with a hot iron. My father, his fingers, in his old age, I mean, he can pick up a frying pan from the bottom and not feel it because he had calloused hands. No sensitivity in the fingers. But what happens sometimes spiritually, we can become like that. We can gossip, we can lie, we can cheat, we can sin, we can live in sin, we can, we can even be immoral and ungodly and still come to church and there's not conviction. Why? Because of callousness. But we need a revelation of the holiness of God that shines in His glory and His brightness and we say, woe is me, I'm undone, I need the grace of God. How many of you know confession is good for the soul. Confession is good for the soul. Confession liberates your soul. You need it. I need confession. The prophet of God, if he needed it. Why? Because he got so close to God. And the closer you and I get to God, the more we're going to realize even our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. You know, sometimes things can look good, but think about, think about something white. You might have a white car, or, or, or maybe you're in the countryside, and you have, you have sheep that look white, but when there's the, the freshly fallen snow, they look brown, or, or they look off-white. Why? Because of the, the comparison or the contrast. And when you see the glory of God, you realize, wait a minute, I need God's grace. We need to confess sometimes, woe is me. God, I'm falling short. But it leads me to point number two, the cleansing. Isaiah's cleansing, verse 6 and 7. At that point, as soon as he made confession, aren't you glad? You see, God brings conviction in our life not to beat us over the head, not to beat us up and cast us aside and say, you worthless, no good loser. It's for our own benefit. That we might open ourselves up for the cleansing of God. It's at that moment that the Bible says one of the seraphim flew from the altar of God and took a live coal and brought it and touched the lips of Isaiah. And God said, now your sin is cleansed. Now your sin is purged. And that's what happens to every person who puts their trust and faith in the Savior. They are forgiven. The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But to get cleansed, you've got to say, whoa. Woe is me. You've got to acknowledge you need it. Amen. You've got to acknowledge you need his grace. And here we have Isaiah. He's saying, I'm undone. But God says, you know what? I've atoned for your sin. Atonement means that you are at one minute with God now. It means that the sin that blocked your relationship 
has been removed. In the Old Testament, in the Day of Atonement that came once a year, the high priest would ceremonially take two, two goats, and on one he would take and he would sacrifice on the altar, and the other goat he would take and he would, he would ceremoniously and, and, and metaphorically, he would take the sins of the people and he would place them on that goat and he would release that goat into the wilderness. And that's where we get the term scapegoat. Meaning that the sins of all of the people were placed on that goat and taken away. Jesus Christ became our scapegoat. He took our sin on his body. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. If the prophet needed a fresh touch, surely you and I do. Pastors, elders, ministry leaders, servants of God, we need our mind renewed, we need our soul restored, and we need our spirits revived. Can you say amen? amen. But what happens is we like to end right there. We like to end right there. Well, we've, had a, we've confessed, uh, we've been cleansed, but the Bible doesn't end right there. After that, open up in your Bibles again, if you will. Your sin is purged. We want to say amen and that's it. But verse 8, I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? He heard a voice. People, some, some Christians in church never get to this place of hearing a voice say, who will go for me? See, this is number, point number three. This is the commission. We have Isaiah's confession, his cleansing, and now we have his commissioning. Here is God saying, who will go? And I said earlier, it's not a desperate, sorry God. It's a generous God who's willing to use Isaiah. It's a glorious, awesome God who's willing to use you and I in his kingdom business. We're not just to save people, we're a sent people. We're not just to save people, we're a serving people. The needs are great in the world. The needs are great in the church. Opportunities to serve God are all over the place. God is looking for servants. God's looking for servants. Not people who want to run things. Husband one day was bragging to his, his friends, his, his male friends. He was saying, in my home, I run things. Just then, his wife walked in to hear him. And he says, yeah, I run the vacuum. I run the dishwasher. God's, look, not looking, for, God's looking for people to run the vacuum cleaner in the church. Hey, Amen. You want to run something? God's looking for you to run. Run the dishwasher in the kitchen. God's looking for you to run the, the mop. God's looking for you to run. Uh, wipe the running noses. <laughs> Amen. In the nursery. God's looking to commission you and I to serve him. Imagine God saying, who will go for me? Who can I send? Still today. There's the cry from the heart of God pleading for a lost world. You see, God is not going to send angels. Not, God's not going to send superhuman beings from a, some, some other planet. I don't believe in extraterrestrial, but just anyway. But God is going to send you and I. He's sending human beings. It's you and I. Someone prayed for us. Someone witnessed to us. Someone ministered to us. My question today is who will go? Who will respond to the call of God? The Lord says, whom shall I send? Isaiah said, here am I. My last point is Isaiah's consecration. We have his confession, we have his cleansing, we have his commissioning, but you know what? There's a consecration. Consecration means to be devoted to a purpose with a solemn dedication. To be devoted to a purpose. Here is Isaiah consecrating. He said, here am I. Lord, send me. What's interesting, I won't read it, but if you look at verses 9 and 10, the work that God was calling Isaiah to wasn't going to be easy. Matter of fact, he wasn't going to see much fruit. 
Matter of fact, he was going to go to a people who he would preach the word to, and instead of them responding, they would get hardened. And that was going to be his ministry. And it wasn't going to be easy. It was going to be difficult. He was going to labor and not see much fruit. But Isaiah was still willing to go. He was still willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me. A lot of times in the church, when there is a a, a ministry to be done, there's a work to be done, what, what we say is, here am I, Lord, send her. Hello? Here am I, Lord, send him. No, Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. See, there was a consecration there because, see, you have to understand, you, you know that you're serving with the right motives when you're willing to serve in spite of the difficulties. Oh, come on, somebody say amen. See, you know you're serving with the right motive when there's no applause and maybe there's no fruit at times. I remember when I first started the church in a storefront on Branch Avenue. And I remember just a year or two into the work, uh, just starting out. And, 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 and as a young person, just, just, just committed to, to serve God and do the work of God and sold out. And I remember one time after a Bible study. It was on a Wednesday night, and, and I remember it was just maybe 10 people, 15 people, and, and I'd been laboring for a couple of years and not seeing a whole lot of fruit, and, and I remember walking back to my car. I had my briefcase. I felt really important with that briefcase. <laughs> and I remember walking back to my car and saying, God, you know, I'm discouraged. I'm serving you. I don't see much fruit. And I remember... The Lord speaking to my heart, not in an audible voice, but just sensing in my spirit, the Lord saying, are you willing to be faithful even if you just minister to a few people? And see, that was reality check. That was what are my motives? What is my purpose? Why am I doing this? Is it to have a big church? Is it to get a name? Is it to get a title? No, no. I had to say, God, you know what? If this is all, if I have to just minister faithfully, I'm willing to do it. See, that was my consecration. And along the way, you still have to make consecrations to God. You, God calls you to do things, and God stretches you, and, and we all tend to like to live in our comfort zone. What's comfortable to us. We sang this morning, Oceans, that song, You Call Me Out Upon the Water. That's a scary place. The old hymn writer says, Where he leads me, I will follow. Been overseas with Dr. Wins, Barnabas Ministries in Africa and different places. And he, he's, he's used that hymn, but he added a, another line to it. He says, where he leads me, I will follow. What he feeds me, I will swallow. That means whatever's set before you, and you don't know what it is. And sometimes it's looking back at you and you think it's still breathing. But you say, where he leads me, I will follow and what he feeds me. Oh, you don't, you don't, you, you, you don't. Come on, do you really want to go on a missions trip? Where he leads me, I will follow. Consecrated to God and see, see, this cannot be, uh, you can't be talked into this. You can't be convinced. See, this all flowed. This all flowed out of a revelation of God. Someone once said a person persuaded against his will is of the same persuasion still. See, I can try to talk you and convince you to do something, but when the Holy Spirit of God, when you get a revelation of God, that's why we believe in praise and worship because we want people to get their eyes on Jesus, not on men. We want people to worship God, not not look at people. We want people to get a revelation of God because when God touches you, things change. When God speaks to you to do something, it's not man that you could easily say, I don't want to do it. You've got to answer to God Almighty. That's why Jesus in the Gospels, he said it this way. He said, the harvest truly is plentiful. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest field. Would you stand together with me this morning? You say, Pastor, this is, this is a little too, uh, too high and too lofty for me. You don't know what I went through this week. You don't know what 
I'm going through in my life. You say, well, that's the Old Testament. What does it look like in the New Testament? Well, the story's told in Luke chapter 5 of a time when Peter, a fisherman, an ordinary fisherman, a rough and a tough fisherman. How many of you ever watched The Deadliest Catch on TV? I've never watched the whole episode, but I've seen glimpses of it. I mean, you you got to be... You, you. You got to be strong, man. You you got to man up, man, to be a to be a fisherman. And here's Peter. And the Bible says he fished all night, caught nothing. Jesus came along, used his boat as a pulpit, began to speak to the multitudes. And here is here is Jesus at the end, finishes his 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 message, and he tells Peter, "You know what? I want to bless you for, but let me use your boat." I want you to cast your net on the other side for a great catch. And Peter said, Master, we've toiled, we've labored all night, we've caught nothing. It's hopeless. Have you ever been there where you, you've done your best and you feel like nothing's happened, accomplished nothing? But Peter had what I call the nevertheless of faith. I'm discouraged. I've tried it all. Nothing's worked. I failed over and over again. Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to let my net down. You know the story, a miraculous catch of fish. A great catch, the boat almost sinks, the nets almost break. It's unbelievable. Peter's response ties into Isaiah right now, what I'm trying to say to you this morning. Peter saw the glory of God in that miracle. And you know what Peter said? Peter had been with Jesus for a little bit of time. But something changed. He saw the glory of God. And at that point, the Bible says, Peter fell on his feet. And he said to Jesus, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. He got a vision like Isaiah. Saw the glory of God. And he said, basically, woe is me. He said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You know what Jesus did? The same thing. He said, do do not be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. See, there was the cleansing. There was the commissioning. From now on, there's a change. What an awesome God we serve. Here's Peter. He's a failure. He's, he's, he's sinful. And he says, Lord, depart from me. I'm a, I'm a wicked man. The Lord says, you know what? I'm ready to use you now. You're at a good place. When you acknowledge your need, when you acknowledge your neediness, God's ready to use you. God's ready to cleanse you, commission you, and you just need to be consecrated and surrender to God. This morning, I want to pray with you. As you receive this word, I believe that it's going to yield fruit in your life. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Would you raise your hands all over this place? Father, I bless the word of God to the hearts of your people. And I bless the hearts of your people to the word of God. I pray today, Lord, every, every hindrance, every blockage, every stronghold of the enemy... And God, if there be any resistancy of sin and rebellion in people's lives, that they would surrender it to you, God. God, you are not a cosmic killjoy looking to take away people's fun. But God, you're a God who wants to give us joy and peace. So when we surrender our little to you, when we yield and confess our sin and and, and forsake it and let it go, God, you fill us with good things. Father, today I pray that this word would not return void, but it will accomplish that for which you sent it. It will prosper in the thing you purposed. And God, we receive the word of God, and I pray that there would be a collective commitment and consecration that says, here am I, Lord. Send me. May we hear your voice when there's an appeal for a ministry. May we hear your voice when we see a neighbor that's laboring and elderly age and they need a a helping hand may we be there may we serve in our community may we serve in our church may we serve even in our home father i pray your blessing upon your word today upon your church in jesus name amen and amen god bless you god bless you take the word of god may the holy spirit bring forth fruit in jesus name amen